and welcome to another Fullscript sponsored educational webinar. I am Dr. Holly Lucille. I'm part of the Integrative Medical Advisory Team at Natural Partners Fullscript, and it is my distinct pleasure to have back with us Dr. Ben Lynch. Now, Ben, I'm going to give the folks out there, maybe the two or three folks that have never heard anything about you, just a little bit of a rundown of your bio. But I do want to throw it to you to have us um, know what's up in your world, because I know that you're up to way more than what's on this little piece of paper. And you <laughs> so much more than what's on this little piece of paper. I hope so. Yeah, let me just get started. So Dr. Ben Lynch, ND, received his cell and molecular biology uh, bachelor's of science degree from the University of Washington and his doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University. His passion for identifying the cause of disease I love that story, um, directed him towards nutrigenomics and methylation dysfunction. Currently, he researches, writes, presents on a worldwide of topics of MTHFR, methylation defects, and genetic control. So thanks for being here once again. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Holly. Always good. You know, every time I talk to you, I get a chance to talk to you, every time I hear you speak, every time I read anything you've written, I learn something. And I don't think that today is going to be any different, especially uh, with our title, you know, glutathione, why it doesn't work. But before we get into that topic, especially the why it doesn't always work part, um, yeah, tell the attendees just what's up with you, more about you. You're so uh, prolific in your work and I always appreciate it. So take it from here. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, like you said, there's there's always more to us than our, our little bios, um, but uh, I would say right now I'm working hard on getting a routine established for myself and my family. We have been mm -hmm. out of our home for two years and we just moved back and that home construction job um, experience was very, very informative about our environmental exposures and i will tell you even though i was drilling our builders about all these different things to use and not to use things still slip by i wasn't aware of them or i told them and it, they got installed anyway and then they'd be ripped out or and things i had no idea that i i found by chance um and thankfully i i had good people who helped me out and protect my family but mm -hmm. I will tell you, do not forget our patients and ourselves are living in a box the majority of our lives. And we're the only species on the planet that builds stuff like this out of unnatural materials. And, and uh, we have to be very, very mindful that the environment should be coming first and be always, always asking, you know, your patients, have you remodeled recently? Did you move into a new home? Did you, did you recently move? Where did you work? Has your office been remodeled? New carpets, new anything? And because this ties into glutathione too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, such, I mean, as you said, informed you quite a bit. I, I, I actually see your next book. I see the title. I see the cover. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it's the, just living life is the best way you get information. That is for sure. Um, so, all right, let's get into glutathione because I was, you know, why it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we love glutathione. We think about glutathione, glutathione, right? It's this huge, major antioxidant responsible for so much. And, of course, when you're talking about environmental exposure, very important. We love it in all its forms. So let's just roll back to the basics first and talk about what the heck is glutathione. Well, glutathione is, is one of our body's top antioxidants. And we have to also define what an antioxidant is. Uh, you know, it's something that takes our oxygen molecule and makes it less reactive. So glutathione is a, a three-part amino acid. It contains glutamine, glycine, and cysteine, and it combines them all together. And in order to do that, it requires multiple genes, and it's a lot of work for the body to produce this compound. It's not easy. You can't just tell your patient to eat a bunch of protein and, and hopefully they absorb it and they're not taking in acids and they're actually chewing their food and they're not drinking a bunch of liquid when they're eating, but consuming protein and absorbing it. But glutathione itself is a three part uh, protein and it's synthesized by 
multiple genes. It actually comes from also homocysteine. Hmm. So if your patient's homocysteine is high or if it's low, you know, that's telling. And, and a lot of people, I'm, I'm going to deviate here real quickly because this is a huge issue. There is no low normal. There's no low value on a homocysteine lab. It's always greater than, or, you know, greater than 15 is bad. And that's too high. So, but if a homocysteine is less than five, how can your patient be making glutathione? So can you, can they all see the screen here? Yep. Okay. So here is homocysteine right here. Okay. Here's homocysteine and follow the arrows. It comes down and here's cysteine. And then, it, and here is your patient's glutathione. Okay. So if your patient has low homocysteine, too low, i.e. less than five, how are they going to be making glutathione? So here's that, that tripeptide. So glutathione is basically its job is to neutralize hydrogen peroxide as an antioxidant. But it does other things too. It helps neutralize and pull out arsenic. It helps neutralize formaldehyde. It helps neutralize chlorine gases. So it does a lot of other things as well. So extremely important, obviously, um, as practitioners, we use it all the time. But from, from, from your knowledge base, what form of glutathione do practitioners usually use? And, and, why, and why? Why do they choose that form? Well, I think it's whatever the, the practitioner is using and uh, for, that's most convenient for them. So for me personally, um, I like to use liposomal glutathione. Some practitioners are IV and their, their clinics are set up for IV, so that's what they use. Right. Um, you know, it gets right into the bloodstream, it bypasses the first effect, you know, it doesn't, the, you know, so the, the liver doesn't destroy it. Um, some practitioners like S-acetyl glutathione because they like selling capsules or like providing capsules to their patients. S-acetyl glutathione is useful because it has an acetyl group bound to the glutathione, and so when the patient swallows the glutathione, the stomach acid doesn't destroy it. It just mm -hmm. cleaves the acetyl group from the glutathione, then the glutathione can be delivered into the system. Is it useful? Yes, s acetyl glutathione is useful. There's also topical glutathione. So topical glutathione is also useful, um, like IV, in that it doesn't hit the microbiome. So when you, anytime you swallow something, your patient swallows something, it's going to be impacted by the microbiome eventually. And what with since glutathione is a sulfur um, compound. So cysteine is very, very high sulfur and cysteine is very, very reactive. So the microbiome will, will get a hold of it and SIBO is everywhere. So we have to be mindful about that too before I get into the side effects. But I, I say that there's a plethora of different uh, ways. And you, you, you talked about earlier, Holly, before we jumped on here about the probiotic uh, special uh, sort increase in glutathione as well, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I've heard that lactobacillus fermentum, I think it was ME3, uh, mm -hmm. was a strain that was actually able to increase glutathione production. Yeah, and, you know, and so when we, when we hear these things, it, it's very useful, but first of all, we have to quantify, right. um, you know, how much glutathione are we talking about? Yeah, it and, sounds good when you say it really fast, especially yeah. in the precision probiotics. Right, you know, you get really excited and it's like, oh, this, this, Lactobacillus fermentum ME3 makes glutathione and you're going to give it to your patient and then your patient gets worse and you're like, what the heck? What, what just happened? Is it, is it from too much glutathione? Are they detoxing <coughs> or is it uh, something else? And lactobacillus fermentum, as we were talking earlier, listen to the, the species, right? Fermentum, Fermented. it ferments. And so then if you have something fermenting, it's going to be producing histamine. And so is the histamine production actually what's stimulating the glutathione production? And I don't know. That's something I need to research because since you said that lactobacillus fermentum, see, I always think mechanisms of action. Right. So is, it, is the lactobacillus fermentum actually producing glutathione or is it stimulating histamine, which is stimulating glutathione? I don't know. Maybe it's right. both. Um, yeah, I'm glad I brought it up. I mean, I, I heard about it. And, and once again, I think you make a great point here that, as I said, it sounds good when you say it really fast, but I think that you have to get in there to understand the mechanism of action because based on case by case, 
uh, you could be actually introducing it and making the situation worse, especially if SIBO is on, you know, is on deck for sure. Yeah, or or the, the individual's histamine metabolizing enzyme in their gut is overwhelmed from histamine producing bacteria um, like Blastocystis hominis. You know, Blastocystis hominis is identified by doctor's data and other labs. And if you carrying Blastocystis hominis and it's pervasive in our water and it's in our foods and I had it and uh, I recently tested using the GI map test and it's gone, um, thankfully, but doesn't mean it can come back. Um, but I was really, really uh, burdened with high histamine symptoms. And so other microbiomes or uh, microbes can be producing histamine or things like methotrexate or amelioride. These are two uh, commonly prescribed meds, which also reduce the histamine metabolizing enzymes to be able to work. So we, we digress to histamine again, um, yeah. but uh, it's, a, it's a big issue. It is. And just to take a quick break for attendees, I know you probably are going to have questions, so please take advantage of the chat box and ask them. And then Captain Cam, who is running this webinar, um, will be slacking them to me and I'll be uh, asking them to Dr. Lynch uh, to get an answer for you. And if we don't get through all of the questions, we'll definitely try to get all of the questions answered to you after the webinar as well. So Ben, you talked about briefly, you, you, you mentioned quickly in a sentence side effects of glutathione. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure part of my brain and some of the other attendees went, what are you talking about side effects of glutathione? Because as you say, it's um, a really important compound. Uh, we need it, especially in our modern day. You know it better than most right now because of what you just went through in building probably one of the cleanest houses that are out there because you had your mind around it and you had your eyes and ears open. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's needed with our environmental exposure. But what are you talking about when you say side effects? Yeah, and so first off, I don't want to give glutathione a bad rap. I love glutathione. It's phenomenal. But Holly, you made a great point. What we love doesn't always <laughs> make it going to be perfect for us. I love my kids, <laughs> but sometimes they're a real pain, you know? We could go on and on and on with analogies, I promise you. Yeah. So, I mean, there's many, many examples. Um, but, you know, at some point, glutathione has affected your patients 100 percent and i guarantee you it is not a detox reaction it's something else there's other mechanisms of action at play here and i'm going to be giving you a few of them because when i researched this and i found evidence in published research i was like wow this is actually really cool um and it made me more cautious uh, about using glutathione but so some of the side effects of glutathione i, I surveyed uh, a number of people in about 300 people 200 and 81 responses I got back and it confirmed the side effects that I saw clinically and uh, just from others in general. So in order, uh, headache, 33% respondents, anxiety, 28%, fatigue, irritability, also 28%, uh, muscle pain, 15%. And then there's, there's like eight others, insomnia, um, rashes, itchy skin, difficulty breathing, um, you know, uh, worsened uh, skin issues and so on. Um, those were not as prolific though, so I didn't write those down. So, but those are the main ones, headache, anxiety, fatigue, irritability, irritability and muscle pain. But Holly, which of those sound all very similar to you? Well, it may sound, as you said, like a detox reaction. Like, oh, we're doing a good job. This needs to happen. We just need to push through. Right, exactly. And that is what a lot of us tell or told our patients. It's going to get and, worse before it gets better. It's a healing uh, crisis. That's right. It's like the homeopathy healing crisis, right? And, and uh, sometimes that does happen, you know, but I have ch totally changed my mindset on this. If the patient or the individual I work with does not get better always, then I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, so, and I love that because... I think it's so important that that guides your thinking because best laid plans, right? Based on your experience, your knowledge. But, you know, when the body is the best biofeedback machine, it's going to tell us. So you always have to keep going back. Hey, where, where are the obstacles to cure? Where do we need to pivot and tweak this clinical situation and therapy? Let me ask you, the survey, this intel, this evidence is pretty profound. And like I said, I'm learning something and uh, I think all of the attendees are as well because it will change the way that we practice 
especially in, in using glutathione, because I think these days we all do. Was there a certain dosage that you had people on? Was this uh, anything more specific than just somebody being, a, it, was there a certain type, anything else that you found that could inform yeah. the situation? So I asked them, um, what are your, ex your current conditions right now? And so that sets the stage. So right. my first question to them was, and I'm happy to send the survey to you all as well. So I can export the survey from SurveyMonkey and I'll just uh, withhold the uh, emails and, and names from them. Would you like me to do that? Sure, that would be great. Yeah, and so the um, you know autoimmune disease was number one. Muscle cramps was actually number two okay. uh, in terms of, of prevalence. Uh, irritability, uh, MSG sensitivity, and headaches. So, and I asked these questions because I was a bit biased in the uh, conditions I put there because I had already studied the, re the mechanisms of action of how glutathione could be problematic for people. And I suspected a lot of these uh, uh, pre-existing conditions would actually flare, would become more flared, or these individuals would be more flared from glutathione. And you're hearing these things and you're like, well, glutathione has helped a lot of my patients with this. You're, you're, you're full of it. Well, true, it does help a lot of these individuals, but some will be worsened from it. And why does that happen then? Why? 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 What's going on? Yeah, it's the mechanisms of action. So the irritability, the headaches, the MSG sensation, the insomnia all have to do with glutamate. Now, there could be other, uh, other things going on here, too. And there, there always is because the body is, is crazy complex. But glutamate, elevated glutamate will increase these things, as we know. So, and glutathione is produced from what? Glutamate, glycine, and? Cysteine, yeah. Cysteine, thank you. Um, so, higher levels of glutamate will cause these problems. And some of these individuals will already have kyanurin in uh, levels. So kyanuric acid, or however you say that crazy word. So if you order right. an organic right. acid, <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy one, but it's- but That so way we they, don't want it to go down. <laughs> yeah, so if they, if they have brain inflammation, pre-existing brain inflammation, so their kyanuric acids are already high, um, they have headaches, they have all these things, and you and you give them glutathione, look what happens. So here's here's the, uh, Got to see here. So here's glutathione right here. Okay. Ah, come on. Got so it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So glutathione will feedback inhibit. See this? I know it's a bit backwards for you guys, but here's glutathione. It feedbacks inhibits this gene. So as you feedback inhibit this gene, you are increasing cysteine levels. Right. And cysteine levels, if the individual has oxidative stress, it's going to turn the cysteine to cysteine cysteine and make reactive nitrogen species. So if they have higher uh, iron levels, if they have higher levels of superoxide um, or what have you, or they're fighting infections or, or what's going on, you know, various things, um, then that cysteine, which now can no longer be making glutathione, is going to become more reactive. And at the same time, cysteine has to be eliminated. And as it's being eliminated, it becomes sulfites wow. okay so cysteine becomes sulfites and elevated sulfites lead to breathing disorders if you ever done ivs on a patient uh with glut iv glutathione to a patient and you've seen them have difficulty breathing it could be the sulfites um and sulfites increase glutamate in the brain as well so when you said that gene this gene what gene was that um the feed so glutathione feedbacks inhibits the gcl gene Okay. And I forget the the name of that gene. Okay. Um, but it uh, that gene is also inhibited by mold, uh, mycotoxins. Yeah. So, so mycotoxins inhibit the formation of glutathione via the inhibition of the GCL gene, and that is from a published paper. And, yeah. Uh, so this makes sense given that pathway that. If there is a, a variant um, or a gene that's inhibited, that people would end up with these symptoms. Um, so it informs, I think, the clinical case even more to maybe dig deeper for data on a DNA perspective, perhaps. But 
when you find this out, what, what, what do you do about it? Well, I, I look to first suss out all the reasons why the individual has higher glutamate levels. And, right. and because glutathione by itself, 500 milligrams of glutathione is not that much. Right. So, and the amount of glutamate that's in there isn't that much. Um, so they had to have something going on there. And another thing I want to share is there's, there's a, there's a, inver there's a kind of a, there's a, a curve and I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but a little bit of glutathione, too low of glutathione in your patient will increase glutamate levels in the brain because I know I'm giving you a ton of information here, but you can listen to this later, right? So just bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm just dumping. We're gonna go down. We'll get, we'll get through this together. Yeah, yeah. This it's a lot of information. So just roll with it and listen to it again later. I'm giving you a lot of little actionable things that you can apply. So too little of glutathione in the brain will increase calcium uh, release, and calcium release is inflammatory. It's destructive. So too little is bad. And glutamate will increase calcium uh, channels to open. And so that's bad. So too little glutathione will increase calcium channel and glutamate. And too high of glutathione will do the same thing. It's the three bears. You need just the right amount. Yeah. You need just the right amount. And so how do you control that? I love using liposomal. And I love informing patients about the pulse method. The pulse method is, you know, understand the symptoms of why you need glutathione. For me, it's a foggy head, not clear thinking. Um, I don't know, I'll take a few drops, a uh, quarter teaspoon, half teaspoon, depending on the uh, significance of it. And then maybe the next day I'll tune in again. How's my head? It's fine. I don't take it. I don't tell my patients, or I, I don't see patients anymore, but I always inform them to tune into how they're feeling, instruct them on what the, the supplement that they're taking does, what symptom that's supposed to, to alleviate. And if they do not have that symptom, they skip taking that supplement at that time. Hmm. So you mentioned the liposomal glutathione because you have best control over dosing based yes. on this three bear analogy. Yes. Yeah. Because for, for me and many others, uh, if you take a liposomal glutathione and you squirt it in your mouth, just a few drops and you hold it, I can literally feel my head clearing. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's very fast. And so patients who have EMS sensitivity, Wi-Fi sensitivity, uh, low glutathione, because, because this EMF and Wi-Fi stimulate calcium channel release. So they have too little glutathione. You give them electrolytes and you give them liposomal glutathione, their EMS sensitivity goes way, 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 way down. I've nullified mine. It's so amazing that you said that. Just see, um, this past weekend, I was at the California Association uh, educational conference called Cells Gone Wild. It was all about autoimmune disease, but I had been in a little bit of a travel swell. Um, and this was my third trip in like a week and a half. I luckily was able to just drive to Palm Springs and not get on a plane. But, you know, so early, started at 7.30, the exhibitors are there. And I literally went up to somebody and said, what can I, I need, I need something. I, I felt, and I, I almost could not articulate it, but I'm like, I just, I need to start you know, lock it in and, and taking things in and and getting through the day. And that's exactly what she gave me. She gave me some liposomal glutathione. And just like you said, hold it. It was right there. And it was almost instant. Yeah, it's unbelievable. When it's the right thing, it nails it. And sometimes it's deceiving because you take it, you hold it, and nothing happens. And when that happens, sometimes I'll stop. And well, I usually do stop and then I'll come back and I'm like, eh, I'm going to take more and then I'll take more. And sometimes it does help. Other times it doesn't. And then when it doesn't help, then I take electrolytes. And when I take the electrolytes, that makes a huge difference. And does it make it completely go away? Sometimes not, because sometimes I'll be uh, just surrounded by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth for a long period of time, maybe a week uh, at a conference. And because I don't have Wi-Fi in my home, um, I'm wired. Everything is wired in this home. Um, and I'm shielded with aluminum uh, roof and aluminum siding and double glazed windows. There's my cell phone reception is horrible. Uh, <laughs> and that's OK. That's OK. Um, but uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, I digress a little bit. But that that is very, very useful because Wi-Fi is a thing. 
and uh, you, you've got to tune in to, to that with your patients too. You know, so okay, from a clinical perspective, because obviously we don't want to scare anybody about glutathione and using glutathione, when it comes to actually then prescribing glutathione, is there a prep that should happen? Is this a new yes. conversation that we should be thinking about having with our patients based on the intel and the evidence of uh, DNA, genes, you know, being downregulated, et cetera? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're spot on and, you know, I'm, I'm going to share with the ones I know and, and obviously I can't share the ones I don't know. but. You know, I just want to state that because I don't know all the reasons why of what to do prior and what all the potential side effects are either. But I do know that uh, microbiome is a massive one. And so and sulfur is a huge one. And when I surveyed these folks, I said, have any of you taken molybdenum? And there was like 80 percent have never tried it using molybdenum. And molybdenum is the cofactor which gets rid of sulfites. Right, and this, Yeah, and and this gene is slowed down by I have it here in my my pathway planner um, is slowed down by arsenic and tungsten. So you know, look, there's we we always concern ourselves of, about genetics and running genetic reports, mm -hmm. but that book over there, it's it's more about the environment. It's more about dirty genes. It's not just about inheriting which SNPs cause a slow SUOX. SUOX, S-U-O-X, is the gene which processes uh, sulfites into sulfate, and then you pee them out. If this gene is slowed for every reason, what it, whether it is a, a genetic polymorphism or a cofactor deficiency of molybdenum or an environmental uh, slug, sluggishness caused by arsenic or tungsten and others, which I don't know about, then you have to evaluate them all, um, and water filtration is a big one. But I would, I would definitely start with molybdenum. That is uh, inexpensive and mm -hmm. easy to use. Um, you know, at Seeking Health, I, I believe you guys carry the our molybdenum drops. It's 25 micrograms per drop, and that's all that's in there basically. So um, this would be the preparatory phase in yes. in glutathione. Yep, and and also a great question is. Uh, a great preface is, do you get headaches from drinking red wine or cheaper alcohols? Yes. Do you get insomnia from that? Yes. Do you get headaches from, well, not headaches, it's different. Um, but there's a lot of sulfites in wine. Or just ask them straight up, how do you handle sulfites? No, right. I, I can't handle them. And it's different than sulfur drugs. Sulfur drugs and right. sulfites, different class. Good distinction. And, uh, yeah. So give them molybdenum and be mindful, though, that as their symptoms improve, they stop the molybdenum. And so it's the 25 micrograms is, is not much. We also have a capsule of 500 micrograms, which these people are pretty overwhelmed with uh, sulfites. So giving them a 500 microgram capsule um, can really help them. As they improve, improve, and their symptoms go way down, you stop the molybdenum. And if they're ingesting a lot of sulfur based foods or sulfur based supplements, um, then you go back up with the molybdenum. And, but if they're not, you stop it. Because molybdenum is also the cofactor for making uric acid. So if you see a high uric acid on a lab, be careful because you might be pushing that. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, it makes sense. And I should mention as well for the folks, um, you are president of SeekingHealth.com, uh, definitely pushing things out to help wash off genes. With your book, Dirty Genes, I just want everybody to know if you're attending this webinar in a live fashion, you will be entered into the random drawing and win um, a copy of Ben's book, Dirty oh, Genes. Cool. An excellent book, changed the way that I think and practice um, uh, for better outcomes. Uh, it, it, it just is a must. If you win it, read it. If you don't, buy it. <laughs> That's what I got to say there. Um, so, okay. Any other thing besides molybdenum when it yes. comes to prep? 100%. When thinking about 100%. now, cautiously <laughs> giving glutathione. Yeah. So, I, my foundational thing is electrolytes. 100% hands down. And electrolytes are are massively important. 99% of women are potassium deficient. 90% of men are potassium deficient. Mm -hmm. Most electrolytes do not have sufficient potassium in there. We need about four to five grams of potassium a day 
in divided doses. You have to be very careful with potassium uh, dosing because for various reasons. Um, but as long as potassium is taken with food, um, the, the risk for over, overdosing it goes way down. It's an empty stomach, which is the biggest issue. Um, but uh, our optimal electrolyte has 500 milligrams of potassium, has a lot of uh, magnesium and ribose and other things. Um, but the remember when I surveyed those folks, the top two uh, pre-existing conditions they had was one was uh, autoimmune problems, number two was muscle spasms and cramps. Okay, so just dehydration in general, because yeah. dehydration is going to concentrate whatever metabolite your patient has. Your body and cries for water. As foundational as hydration is, how many people after a, an adequate assessment in my practice are frankly just dehydrated? Oh yeah, they ignore it. They Completely. ignore it. And then they're tired. So get this, the first sign that I know I need water is I get a little bit of fatigue. Just a yep. little bit of fatigue. And it doesn't take much of dehydration to get uh, brain fatigue. And so they, they drink something that typically dehydrates them further. They get some caffeine or sugar, which is further dehydrating. So you, you hydrate your patient. And I, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard over and over. People just come up to me when I go to conferences and say, I feel so much better uh, with the electrolytes now. It's just amazing. Drinking water um, and having electrolytes on board is amazing. Yeah, and, and water is not hydration. Water is water. Uh, hydrating is getting water inside the cell. So and that and getting electrolytes inside the cell. But I don't. I, that's a whole other topic. So, but I start with electrolytes. I start with molybdenum, and then I use the cofactors for recycling glutathione, um, and also <clears throat> a a compound like PQQ to neutralize reactive oxygen species because if your patient has a lot of reactive nitri nitrogen species or reactive oxygen species whatever cysteine is accumulating or glutamate is going to cause more havoc so by giving a, a supplement of PQQ you're neutralizing a ton of free radicals which is going to make the glutathione less damaged and also by giving riboflavin you're going to recycle the damaged glutathione because glutathione is reduced, which you've heard, reduced glutathione, that's good. Once it neutralizes hydrogen peroxide <clears throat> or arsenic or formaldehyde or chlorine, then it becomes oxidized glutathione and that is very harmful stuff, very harmful. And it has to be recycled by using riboflavin. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen deficient riboflavin on patients' organic acid labs. It's pervasive. And right up there with the uh, presentation of the headache, as you know, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is all paving the way to get the best bang um, for your butt, per se, when you want to give glutathione. Yes. Yeah. And so in all this time, I've been, you know, I've been mindful of the glutathione side effects for a long time. I mean, even ever since, uh, you know, I was in as a clinician, a student clinician at Bastyr, um, I saw my first sulfur side effects from DMSA. DMSA mm -hmm. is a similar thing. You, mm -hmm. you see body rashes, you see headaches, you see intolerance, you see sulfite excess, molybdenum for, for neutralizing DMSA, which is now pulled, unfortunately. Um, but so I formulated optimal liposomal glutathione plus with these cofactors. It's got the PQQ. It has, oh, I forgot one, selenium. Selenium allows the use of glutathione. So if you have the glutathione, but you do not have the selenium, the glutathione is just gonna sit there and it's not gonna be able to neutralize the hydrogen peroxide because the, the glutathione peroxidase gene requires selenium. So the glutathione, if it's just sitting there and it can't be used, it's gonna get oxidized eventually. So you have to have sufficient selenium, but not too much because too much selenium is also toxic because it's a, it's a metal or a mineral. Um, so you have to be careful with those. So optimal liposomal glutathione has got selenium, it has the PQQ, it has the riboflavin, and it has the molybdenum, all built in along with the, or along with the glutathione and the phosphatidylcholine. And it's, I'll warn you, it's not the best tasting. Uh, the, the optimal liposomal glutathione mint is my favorite one but the plus is definitely 
uh, helping a lot of people who were otherwise unable to take glutathione. Well, I think, you know, from a patient adherence perspective, that's the old dossier. You know, this is doctor's teacher. It's like, hey, the risk benefit ratio. And I've had this conversation sternly with a couple of my patients where they're like, you know what, that tastes like crap. I'm like, well, guess what? <laughs> Get over it because <laughs> this is what we need to do. The risk benefit ratio of you having this on board versus your taste buds getting a little burden for a bit of the day uh, is just, you know, it's, it's the benefit is there. Definitely, and, and that was also one of the, uh, I think a lot of people in the survey commented, they said, you know, I don't care how gross it tastes, the outcomes are so huge. And then there's other people said that it was a minimal, it was like 3%, I think, the taste is so bad, I won't touch it. It's like, all right, you know, so be it. That's the obstacle to cure, but. Yes, yes, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> in so many different cases. All right, I want to back up then and, you know, I want to talk about, I know it has been uh, common for practitioners to actually just provide the building blocks of this compound, you know, uh, so in, in the form perhaps of N-acetylcysteine. What do you think about that? What do you see there? There goes a glutathione side effect issue. No, <laughs> um, no so N-acetylcysteine is wonderful when it's used properly. And I learn from early on too, NAC makes glutathione. And when you look on this pathway, so here is your cysteine. Yeah, everything's backwards. So here's your cysteine, okay? Yeah. Goes to glutathione. But is N-acetylcysteine the only thing that makes glutathione? That cysteine has to go through this gene and this gene in order to make your glutathione. So it is not the only thing. So cysteine is the rate limiting step to synthesize glutathione. That is 100% true. But you also need to have, um, well, look here, you need ATP. So your patients need to be, their mitochondria need to be running well. Everybody has ATP just to one extent. And then there's manganese, uh, magnesium. Oh, look at that, magnesium. There's a electrolyte. And then glutamate. Most people have sufficient glutamate anyway. And then, but look at this purple. I know everything's backwards for you all, but this is mycotoxins. Mycotoxins, and these are all from published literature, all these little things here. So mycotoxins inhibit this. So if you're giving your patient with mold exposure or mycotoxins in their home, N-acetylcysteine, and they're magnesium deficient, okay, and they've got mold, that, that N-acetylcysteine ain't gonna do anything. It's just, it's just, it's a mucolytic. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna build up their cysteine and the cysteine, since they're having mold, they've got a lot of, of oxidative stress going on. That cysteine's gonna to go to cysteine, make reactive nitrogen species, they're gonna get worse. And then not, not only that, but NAC is a mucolytic and it's gonna dry out their mucous membranes and they're probably gonna get drier eyes if they stay on it longer term, they're gonna get um, possible nosebleeds or they might get a enhanced leaky gut because the mucous membranes in the gut are also harmed. Um, so I love any acetylcysteine uh, when there's lung congestion or there's nasal congestion and you need to break up mucous membranes. I think it's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Um, but long-term use makes me very nervous. I had a, uh, I go all in on supplements. <laughs> I used to, um, I took NAC, I forget how much I took, maybe it was just a 500 milligrams a day or something, I don't remember, but I took it every day. And I think I took it every day for months. And every single day, every time I took a shower, I got a nosebleed. And my eyes were so dry, they were always dry. I was like, what the heck, what is it going on? And finally, I, I sussed out what I was taking, I stopped the NEC, the nosebleeds went away, my dry eyes went away. And who knows what I did to my gut. Yeah. You know, I um, years ago when I was sort of searching for a tagline, what have you, um, I, I, you know, I actually got this from being in practice, and I would get through a, an incredible, you know, intake and have that good clinical acumen, and, and literally most of the time I would just push my chair back and I would say out loud, "Let's think this through," mm, right? And yeah. you're such a great, you're exemplary as far as thinking things through because I think that's just how your mind works. It's amazing. Because you take the science and make the you know you put the dots really really close together and, and help us connect them um, and thinking things through, especially when it comes to better outcomes in our 
in my opinion, tougher and tougher and tougher clinical cases in our modern day. Um, just really, really appreciated. So I'm going to ask you one question, then I want to roll to the questions that are rolling in on my Slack here. Um, okay. What about food sources of glutathione? What do you think about that? Are, are there um, any? Yeah, yeah, there, there are. Um, and uh, I saw that question. I, I meant to to look at my email from Dr. David Quigg because um, he he goes, I, I do the poor man's glutathione. I was like, what's that, David? And he goes, uh, sprouts, broccoli sprouts, and but broccoli sprouts. Um, I'll warn you, they're they're potent. <laughs> uh, they're really potent. So I would definitely recommend mixing them with other sprouts. Um, yeah. And then you need to have radish sprouts to activate whatever that compound. What's that compound in, in broccoli? It's a crazy long word. Sulforaphanic acid or? That's yeah. it. Yeah. So, and then the, the radish sprouts helps activate that. So, so have your patients grow broccoli sprouts and radish, but I, I recommend you do it first and maybe even do it in your clinic and they can try them. Um, and the best website that I love for sprouts and, and I, I'm a little nervous because it seems like they're struggling. So your support would be appreciated. <clears throat> I have no affiliation. I've just been using them for a long time. It's Sprout People. So Sprout oh, People. Sprout. Dot, yeah, SproutPeople.com. Great website, great tools, um, great people. And Dr. David Quigg has been getting his sprouts uh, from them and growing his own glutathione. Another thing you should know, too, yeah, is, that's yeah, is, is David said that, uh, you know, because Doctor's Data runs RBC glutathione labs, and he says hands down liposomal glutathione is superior than IV for raising the RBC glutathione. He goes, the RBC glutathione, okay. the half life of glutathione is 12 minutes. So when you take liposomal glutathione, you can take it, you know, in the morning, you can take it in the afternoon. And another thing I should talk about with dosing glutathione, it's better to take a little bit more often. Than a lot at once. It's so better. consistency over intensity. Yes, because if you have a cons a constant, let's say you moved to a new home, your patient moved into a new home, and they've got uh, particle board furniture everywhere, new flooring, new carpets, uh, all yeah. this stuff. They're just formaldehyde all over. Glutathione metabolizes formaldehyde, so it's better than take say a quarter teaspoon five times a day, rather than one teaspoon once a day because that, that glutathione is just going to be damaged and all day they're, they're breathing 14, you know, thousand liters of air and there's a lot of formaldehyde in it. So do have them do it throughout the day. So start low, go slow, consistency over intensity for sure. I have to tell you a story about my radish sprouts. So, um, the, and when you say they're potent, they're, they're very potent. So I was in uh, London this past, uh, late last year for a preventive medicine conference and I was staying near a Whole Foods and so I was gonna fly out and I don't like to waste anything. So even though I think it was probably against, against customs, I had these radish sprouts that I still had. And so I bought them, they put them in my backpack, I flew home with them and the next morning I thought, oh, I'll just make a juice out of the things that are in the refrigerator and I put these broccoli sprouts in my juice. I went to the office with these broccoli sprouts, you know, Vitamix up in my, my big juice container and I had a patient that stopped me in my tracks in the middle of our session and said, did somebody, did, did somebody take a crap in here? Because it smells horrible. And I, you know, everybody was like, and I am like, oh my God, my juice smelled so incredibly bad. Yeah. Like I literally almost lost a patient. Um, so the, oh. they're profound. Yeah, and, and, and be mindful of that too, because liposomal glutathione will do the same thing. So, uh, yes. or similar, not, not same, similar. It's less potent than yeah. those. I've got a question here that, that addresses that. So here we are from our attendees. Um, how can we raise GSH level in a person with a CBS mutation, particularly increased enzyme function, as opposed to decreased function? I was found to have very low, uh, excuse me, HCY and high TAU and low GSH. So the basic question, how can we raise GSH levels in a person with a CBS mutation? Okay, uh, I have a video on YouTube that talks about if you Google, uh, well, if you search in YouTube, CBS 
uh, Ben Lynch, you'll see a video where I talk about the CBS gene uh, pretty thoroughly. Um, it's a great the, video. Yeah, the the whole thing about the CBS gene, the SNP, is is uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And and what I will say is, yes, a CBS gene can work faster in in these six nine nine variant individuals, but it can also work faster in individuals who have lower glutathione. Why? Because oxidative stress speeds up the CBS gene to work. Why mm. would why would oxidative stress speed up the CBS gene? Well, because the body wants to synthesize glutathione. So the 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 speed of CBS is is more important in understanding no the understanding of what stimulates the CBS gene, i.e. the enzyme to function, is more important than looking at what SNP is there. So ignore the genetic reports, look at what is going on, and I will show you here. So here's the CBS gene, okay? Purple slows things down and orange speeds them up. So we have uh, low cysteine will speed up the CBS gene and we have hydrogen, or sorry, low homocysteine, yeah, will speed it up. We have hydrogen peroxide will speed it up and we have reactive oxygen species will speed it up and high methylation, high CME, will speed it up and the cofactor is vitamin B6. Things that slow it down, are the opposite, high levels of glutathione. So if you have a fast CBS 699, you would probably want to consider glutathione. Uh, low reactive oxygen species also slows it down. So su supplementing with things like PQQ or optimal liposomal glutathione plus would help. Low SAME levels. So supporting methylation, but not in excess. Testosterone levels uh, slow it down. So, you know, I don't know what works with that. I'm not a hormone guy. Um, high cysteine levels will also slow it down. So it's, it's really important to understand the, what is triggering these genes uh, to produce these enzymes rather than just focusing on the SNP. And that's what Dirty Genes is all about. And that's, I wrote the book because there was so much, there is <laughs> so much misinformation on the internet. And I also catered to the misinformation on the internet in the beginning, and I probably still do. Uh, but if I if I find I make a mistake, I correct it. And this whole CBS, I'm going to swear, but I'm not, <laughs> is is driving me crazy um, because there's too much focus on it, and you got to focus on the epigenetics. All right. So once again, folks on YouTube, CBS Ben Lynch, look it up. A lot more information there. That was a question. I think we already answered this NAC question. Um, I do have a question. Why does it taste so bad? Sulfur. Sulfur. Uh, sulfur is, is, is nasty um, and sulfur stinks. Uh, have you ever been to a war, uh, hot pool or, um, you know, any, any uh, right out of the ground. New thermal hot springs? Uh, there, I went to a, a town in, in New Zealand called Rotorua and Rotorua is a, is a hotbed of geothermal activity. And you drive, you're not even in this, the town yet, and it reeks to high heaven. So it's just a sulfur. Rotten eggs. All right. Um, okay. I've been getting glutathione IV pushes, but I recently heard that a glutathione drip is better for someone with heavy metal toxicity since it enters your body at a slower rate. Can you comment on this? I don't know about the whole heavy metal uh, connection because glutathione helps, you know, pull metals. and I know talking with Dr. Stephen Jenis and Dr. David Quigg and Dr. Anderson and, and others that, you know, glutathione pushes are, are very useful and liposomal glutathione is very, very useful. Um, what I do know is anytime you put in a substrate, anytime you burden uh, an enzyme with too much of something, it requires work. And so, you know, if you're, if you're loading someone up with glutathione fast, they're going to use up more molybdenum. They're going to use up more riboflavin. They're going to use up more uh, other oxidative um, things to, you know, to help recycle that. They're going to use up more selenium. So don't forget, there's there's a give and go here. So if you wake up in the morning at six o'clock and you go for a run, it's different than when you wake up at six in the morning and you take a shower. The nutrient requirements for that are totally different. 
So when you mm -hmm. are pushing your patient with a bunch of IV glutathione, you have to make sure that those cofactors to to one to to process the glutathione so it can be active with selenium, to recycle it with the riboflavin, to pull out the sulfites with the molybdenum, to make sure there's magnesium and electrolytes on board, and to make sure that they don't have too much oxidative stress. It's all important. Well, you've made a couple points this uh, this webinar about more is not necessarily better. Yes. Period. And right. You also made a point about, and you were going to swear, but you didn't regarding the crap on the internet. But I have to tell you, it's really important for us to stay on our toes because just yesterday I saw a patient who thought she might be, even though she knew nothing about what it meant under methylating. She was on mm. four different self 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 prescribed combination methylating substances, four different yes. ones, standalone right. combination ingredients, and methylating 100%. Um, and let me, so let me we'll keep thinking. Real quick. I know you, you want to honor these questions. Um, at Seeking Health, the most am amount of methylfolate that we have in any supplement is one milligram. We, we will not carry a five milligram. We will not carry a 10 or a 15. If you have to go more than a milligram of methylfolate, something else is wrong. So you have to figure out what else is wrong. You can't be pushing or bulldozing your patient with high amounts of methylfolate. It's dangerous stuff. It's way higher than the RDA. And you're gonna, you might see initial benefit for a week, a couple months, maybe even a year if you're lucky um, or longer. But if even if they're on that high dose, there's something else wrong that you've got to find it. Yeah, because so, clinically you're back to somewhat of a, a whack-a-mole game. Yeah. Uh, for sure. yeah. A lot of fanfare around here regarding your webinar. All yeah. the sirens are out now. Okay, so the body makes an estimated 10 plus grams GSH per day, liver alone. How can 400, 400 to 800 milligrams of liposomal uh, GSH affect feedback inhibition of GSH synthesis, biosynthesis? Uh, I don't know. I, I did not, I was not aware if 10 grams of glutathione was made a day. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know, um, but I do know that, uh, you know, just clinical evidence and, uh, you know, personal evidence and seeing my own kids and my family and patients I've worked with that, uh, you know, you, you give these things and there's, there's it's a bell-shaped curve. And, and it's, remember, it's not just the glutathione. So let's say you give 500 milligrams of glutathione. There's also cysteine and cysteine is the most plentiful sulfur-based compound in the body. And that's the rate limiting step for glutathione synthesis. So if so cysteine levels are becoming elevated for various reasons, then we're gonna have problems. And individuals with rheumatoid arthritis have higher levels of, of cysteine. Why? Well, again, if you look at mechanisms of action, see, so here's your cysteine. In order to get rid of cysteine by the body, it pees it out, okay? It, you pee it out. But it's not always that easy. TNF alpha slows the first gene down to be able to remove cysteine. So if your patient is inflamed, that cysteine is is preventing, is getting slowed significantly from getting peed out into the body in the first place. And look, and how many patients with autoimmune disease have higher levels of TNF alpha? A ton. So A ton. By, you're going to get feedback issues because you're conserving substrate too. So by giving glutathione, your patient is going to have cysteine sitting around longer because that cysteine isn't going to be going to glutathione and it's going to be reacting into reactive nitrogen species. Cysteine is extremely reactive. Homocysteine, we always hear that being the bad boy, or the bad girl. It's the cysteine. Cysteine is just nasty. All right. All right, that's a great answer to that question. So what do you re recommend for electros electrolytes, uh, brands, et cetera? Well, I'm, of course, I'm going to be biased, but uh, I'm biased because I, I've worked in the supplement industry. I worked for Biogenesis as a student rep for a long time. I've been around supplement industry for a long while. And so I best optimal is optimal electrolyte, hands down, by seeking help. Um, okay. And we have it in stick packs for, for travel, and we have it in bulk. And there's orange grape and unsweetened. Plain is being changed to the unsweetened. And this does not taste bad. No, I love it. It tastes like seltzer. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, do you have any thoughts on using glutathione to help sleep? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would just be careful um, about using in the evening. I would more use the glutathione. It's like using adrenal cortex in the morning with breakfast mm -hmm. for patients to help their sleep at night. Mm -hmm. So, I, I would be mindful of giving glutathione at night. I use an aura ring to track, and I recommend you use it for your patients too. Um, but uh, I don't know if it would affect my sleep because I don't take it at night because it has phosphatidylcholine in it, and phosphatidylcholine can break down in the choline, which makes a building block back to acetylcholine, which is stimulating for our brains. Um, but I, I, I would say that yes, it would definitely help with insomnia. It definitely helps with anxiety and mood disorders, one hundred percent. It's phenomenal stuff. I love it. Just be careful how you use it. All right, thinking things through. So, um, if someone has an MSG allergy, can they take products like glutamine or glutathione? Are these in the same class? What are the glutamine or glutathione derived from? Yeah, uh, so if somebody has, I don't wanna call it an MSG allergy, I would call it an MSG sensitivity. Uh, monosodium glutamate is, a, is, a, is a basically a drug that's formed to hyper stimulate the taste buds or the, the taste uh, receptors in the brain. So when you go to a restaurant and you're eating foods with MSG in it, it just makes you hyper aware of the flavor and you, you love it. And so you consume all of it. Um, so that's why food industry loves MSG because you eat the whole bag, right? Who can eat that? Yeah. Um, so if someone is struggling from MSG, then it could be just glutamate and glutamate is metabolized by a few different genes, but GAD is one, and magnesium and vitamin B6 are cofactors to help uh, eliminate this. Sulfites uh, is another one. So higher sulfites will increase glutamate, so it'll be using molybdenum. So if someone with an MSG sensitivity, I would be highly using uh, uh, a little bit of glutathione, but prior to that, I would be giving an electrolyte or molybdenum um, to knock the sulfites down, and um, but any, everything that we just talked about, optimal life is all glutathione plus electrolytes. Yeah, okay. I would say start with those two. So two more questions here. Um, what's your favorite lab to test dysbiosis, uh, leaky gut, etc.? GI Map Diagnostic Solutions. Okay, GI Map Diagnostic Solutions. Um, should you be cautious of giving glutathione when a patient has amalgams? I've heard that. I don't understand it. I, yeah, I, I honestly don't understand it. Um, if somebody has amalgams, they've got mercury, and uh, you, you need to get it out. And the glutathione helps mobilize it and get it out. Dr. Yeah. Stephen Jenis doesn't get it either. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, Stephen. Uh, if you don't know Dr. Stephen Jenis, you, you should. Jenis. Um, somebody asked him about the Cutler protocol, and he was like, "What?" I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, so, but Dr. Jenis has been working with environmentally sick patients for a long, long, long time. Very wise man. All right, last question here. Um, is that diagram in your book or where can I get a copy? It seems like you reference it quite a bit and oh. it would help me understand the pathways. Yes, um, look, Einstein, kind of smart dude, right? He said, never mind, memorize anything you can look up. You can't. I take it to heart every day. Yeah. So I first started with M. T. Jafar. That was the first gene I read about. And I was like, okay, I just started giving everybody methylfolate. And then I learned B2, but riboflavin was the cofactor. So I was just giving a bunch of that. And people were getting better. And some people weren't of making them worse. And then I realized that, oh, there's more genes in the human body besides one. And so I started drawing on pieces of paper and connecting them all. And it, eventually it turned out to, to being this. It's called strategine. And so strategine is, is basically your, your patient can run their 23andMe tests and their ancestry tests, and you can export their raw data into strategine, and you get the genetic information. But that's great, that's awesome. But what's most important are the pathways. Okay, yeah. and at Seeking Health, we, we offer the posters. I don't know if you guys offer the posters, um, uh, but it may be something to consider. I don't know how you, it's not a supplement though. 
Um, yeah. Our posters are great because they're two feet by three feet and they're laminated. So you can draw on them with dry erase markers and the patients love it because uh, you're, you're, with, you're with them and they learn it. I, I don't have one on the wall yet. I need to mount it. Well, Dr. Lynch, thank you once again uh, for your work. Congratulations on being back in your home, uh, yes. establishing that routine. I'm, I'm going to be really excited and happy for you because I know how important that is in general. Thank you for your humility, the way that you dive into this work and you back up and correct and continue to learn more and take everybody with you. Um, you're always giving back, so it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Folks, once again, if you have any questions, we're gonna try to get them answered. From what I could see, that's all that we've had. If there are any more, Ben, I'll make sure that you get them. And then also, make sure you stay tuned, full script for other educational webinars and as well, the winner of the Dirty Jean book. If you win it, read it. If you don't win it, buy it, all right? All right, thanks so much. Thanks, Holly.